Great. Uh, well, good morning, Emmanuel family. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, please could you turn with me to John chapter 21. Uh, while you do that, can I just give a big welcome to you if this is one of your early visits uh, to Emmanuel. Again, we are so thrilled uh, to have you join us. Uh, as Kelly said, my name is Sipo. And um, yeah, I, I hope this is a safe space to tell the story, but I was about 12 years old uh, when I first became a, a school prefect. Now, you might be familiar with the concept. Uh, prefects are members of the student body who are assigned the task of helping lead and enforce discipline um, in the rest of the school. And let me tell you something. I loved being a prefect. Ooh, I loved, loved, loved being a prefect. I loved the, the blazer that we got to wear. I loved the, the cool little badge that we got to put on. And I especially loved the power. But that's another story. And it was, going, it was going great. It was going great up until the point where late in the year, a friend of mine who wasn't a prefect got into an altercation with a younger group of students. And so this friend of mine comes to me, and he wasn't a prefect, by the way. He comes to me, and he, he asks me, hey, hey, man, can I just borrow your badge quickly and, and punish these kids? And me being the good friend that I was, I was like, sure, take it. So apparently that was a huge, huge mistake. In fact, two days later, I found myself in the head teacher's office having to explain why I had disrespected the badge and desecrated the office of, of prefect by <laughs> letting this friend of mine cosplay as a prefect. Long story short, after a, after a severe discipline, and by severe discipline I mean a spanking, um, I'm from Africa, we didn't do timeouts where, where I come from. <laughs> but anyway, um, after this, this hiding, I was stripped of my prefect ship, badge taken away, could no longer wear the blazer. And I remember in that moment, and I can actually feel it telling it now, the humiliation, the embarrassment, the, the pervading sense of just failure. That, that might not be your story. In fact, I hope that's not your story. But I think when we all look through the rear view mirror of our lives, there's moments where we failed. Yeah, maybe for you it was you lost your temper and said something you shouldn't have. Maybe you cut a corner at work. Maybe you told a white lie, whatever that is. Or maybe, maybe for you it's actually not something you look back at. Maybe when you walked into this room this morning, you, you would, if you were honest, you would say, actually, I'm in the middle of a habit or an addiction that I just can't shake off. And so we're all faced with failure at some point in our lives. And I think the question that often is hanging over us, maybe even today, is this, what do you do when not if, but when you fail. Or if I could move this a bit closer to your postal code, what do you do when you fail God? So we've landed in part three of a preaching and teaching series that we've called And He Appeared Many Times, in which we are taking a, a deep dive into the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus in, in John's Gospel. And what we've learned over the last two weeks is that when, when people had an encounter, when the early Jesus followers had an encounter with Jesus, they went from despair to hope, and from faith, from unbelief to faith. That was last week. And so we come to our text, John chapter 21. If there's a word that describes the experience of the main character in this passage, it's the word failure. What do you do when you fail God? Well, for some of us, we hide away from God out of shame and guilt, as we've heard this morning. For some of us, what we do is try and perform, 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 in an attempt to, to maybe prove to ourselves and maybe even to God that, yeah, we're actually not that bad after all. But in this passage, the risen Lord Jesus is going to show us another way, a better way. So let's just jump right into the passage. Verse 1, John chapter 21, it says, After this, well, 
after white. Um, so if you remember last week, we were introduced to Thomas. Um, Thomas was uh, a follower of Jesus who just refused to believe that Jesus had, had risen from the dead. And Jesus, in his grace, shows up to Thomas, and Thomas goes from complete unbelief to complete faith. And then curiously, John ends his gospel account. And he, he writes this, he writes, Jesus did many, many signs, so many, in fact, that I couldn't write about them, but the ones that I've written about are written so that you would believe, and by believing, you would have life in his name. Seems like a really great place to end your gospel account. And then John chapter 21 comes along, and this feels like a, a post credit scene. If you've watched those Marvel movies, the, the purpose of a post credit scene is to, is to tie up loose ends. Now, what loose ends are being tied up, we'll, we'll see in just a minute. But let's carry on. After this, Jesus revealed, he, he showed himself, he manifested himself, himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. Now, the... The sort of opening batsmen in this cast of characters are, are interesting. We've got Peter. Peter's fresh off denying Jesus three times. We've got Thomas. We were introduced to him last week, the guy who just wouldn't believe that Jesus was alive. And we've got Nathaniel. Nathaniel is, is funny because he's the guy who, when his buddy told him about Jesus and told him, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, he was like, ew, he's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? So all these guys are, in a way, failures. In a way, these guys are people who have failed Jesus in some way, shape, or form. But it says that they were together. What do you do when you fail God? Or you get in community. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you might be healed. And what James, the brother of Jesus, is communicating is that there is a power when we are open, when we confess our sins to each other, even to the point of healing. I told you guys I'm from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Pete. <laughs> and um, my, my church, the church that I used to go to, has, has this mantra. And it's quite simply this, that community is my cover. And what that's communicating is that when, when we're left by ourselves, friends, we are vulnerable. Our failures can overwhelm us unless we have people that can, in the words of Galatians 6, bear our burdens. So Emmanuel Church, how are we doing? Who knows your failures? Who's encouraging you? And on the flip side, who are you encouraging? Who are you speaking life into? What do you do when you fail God? You get in community. The story continues. Verse 3. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So here's Peter, humiliated and embarrassed. Peter has failed Jesus in possibly the worst way possible. Now, we have to kind of catch up with Peter's story. Peter has been walking closely with Jesus up until this point. He's, he's been one of Jesus' main guys. He's been a prominent figure in the, in the gospel account. And so it's no surprise then that when Jesus gathers his disciples together hours before he goes to the cross and tells them again what's about to happen to him, Peter's like, no, 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 Jesus, Jesus, I, I'm your guy. Even if, even if these other jokers deny you, I never will. Jesus, I'm, I'm your guy. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to deny you. And then he does in spectacular fashion because it's just a few hours later as, as Peter's standing outside the, the, the officials and the, and the Jewish high priest's house, while Jesus is standing trial, Peter's asked three times by servants, who, by the way, their testimony wouldn't have even been admissible in a court of law. Peter's asked whether he knows Jesus, and three times Peter denies it. 
have you have you ever been there? Maybe you made a promise to your to yourself and maybe even to God that you would never do that thing or you'd never do that thing again, but somehow, some way, you found yourself in it again. Failure. Have you ever been there? And so what do we do when we when we fail God? We can think that, oh, God, God wouldn't use me. His, his purposes for my life are over. And so we hide away, we isolate ourselves, or we distract ourselves. Ever, ever been there? Now, I'm going fishing. There's, um, there's some scholarly debate about what this actually means. Um, so one group of people say, well, this is Peter repudiating his life as a disciple. He's saying, no more, I'm not following Jesus anymore. Goodbye to this life, I'm going back to my old life. But another school of thought is a bit more nuanced. They say, well, mm, with Jesus gone, these guys probably needed uh, a way to provide for themselves and their families, and going fishing was the, was the only way they knew how. Now, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, but isn't it true that when we fail God, the, the purposes and plans, the things of God can often take a backseat in our lives? Have you ever been there? So the, the American preacher uh, Crawford Loritz says that when we read the Bible, we should read it in its uh, historical, literal, grammatical, and theological context, yes and amen, but we should also take care to, to read it in its emotional context. Can't you just feel the confusion, the uncertainty here? Like... <laughs> It's amazing. We've just experienced something amazing. Jesus has appeared to us two times already, but what, what happens now? And for Peter, the question is, does he forgive me? Is there still hope? Enter verse 4. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. And I love that Jesus calls them friends. Some versions say uh, children. Jesus, in his kindness, in his mercy, and his forgiveness, still calls these guys friends. Verse 6, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one who Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. So in, in Luke chapter 5, we see Jesus performing this exact same miracle. So what's happened in Luke chapter 5 is Jesus has been teaching the crowds from Peter's boat that he's borrowed. And once, once school's out, Jesus says to Peter, well, you know, if, if you want to get a great catch, you should probably cast your nets into, into deeper waters. Now, Peter's a little bit skeptical because, first of all, what does this guy know about fishing? He's a rabbi. But secondly, these guys have been fishing all night and have caught nothing. But he kind of shrugs his shoulders and says, ah, oh, well, Jesus, if, if you say it, then I'll do it. And lo and behold, they catch the mother load of all catches. In fact, they catch so many fish that their nets tear and their boats threaten to submerge. And so you can kind of see the, the gears turning in, in John's head like, oh my goodness, I, I've seen this before. Peter, Peter, it's the Lord, it's him, he's back, he's large, he's in charge, he's sovereign over all nature. Peter, it's the Lord. And check out what Pete, Peter does. He, he says he, he, he heard that it was the Lord. He tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and he plunged into the sea. He plunged into the sea. He plunged into the sea. In other words, Peter makes a beeline for Jesus. What do you do when you fail God? You run to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith.
You know, it's interesting. Peter's actually not the only disciple who had failed Jesus. Fact is, of course, the, the notorious Judas Iscariot. Judas was the Jesus follower who handed Jesus over to the authorities in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. Now, the Bible says that when both Peter and Judas realized what they had done, they realized their failure, both of them actually wept. But Judas's story ends with him taking the the proceeds of his illicit activities, buying a field, and killing himself. So, why the different outcomes? Well, the Bible explains it this way in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. It says, Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which brings about salvation. But, worldly sorrow leads to death. What's, what's godly sorrow? Godly sorrow is being broken, heartbroken at the failure, but placing your trust and hope in the love and forgiveness of a good God. So if I could swing by your neighborhood again, have you experienced the love and forgiveness of Jesus? The Bible goes on to say that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Have you experienced the kindness of Jesus? What's repentance? Repentance means to to change your mind, to be going in this direction, but then to turn around and go in that direction. What do you do when you fail God? You run to Jesus. The story continues. Since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire, we'll come back to that in a little bit, there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, The net was not torn. All of this kind of begs the question, if if Jesus has this fish cooking already and this bread prepared, why does he ask these disciples to bring in their catch? In fact, why perform the miracle at all? Maybe it's to show us that Jesus doesn't need our good works. In fact, our good works aren't the basis on which he accepts us. The basis on which we're accepted is grace. Now, what is, what is grace? grace? Grace is getting the good that you don't deserve. Grace, in the words of my Sunday school teacher, is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace means that you get pudding even though you didn't eat your veggies. <laughs> grace is the unearned, unmerited favor of God. Grace. There's a, there's a fairly popular TV show. Um, it's called The Voice. I don't know if any of you have seen it. But the premise of this show is that wannabe singers get on and, and they have the opportunity to sing in front of a panel of professional judges. But the catch is the judges actually can't see them, so their backs are turned to them. But if they like what they hear, They kind of slam the buzzer, turn around, and say, I want you on my team. My friends, if you and I are in Christ, we stepped onto the stage of eternity, and before we sung a word, before a note was played, God turned around and said, I want you on my team. That is grace. And check it out. It says that Jesus is grace, his provision is lavish. They have more fish than they could possibly ever eat. Translation, there is more grace for your failures than you would ever need. 
you have been adopted into the family of God, qualified to share in the inheritance with all the saints. And friends, that's not because of your good behavior. There's no amount of quiet times. There's no amount of church attendance. There's no number of streaks on the YouVersion Bible app. There's no, there's no attending prayer that could, that could get you into God's good books. No, the basis of our acceptance is grace. And that's good news, because here's the kicker. If, if our good works aren't the basis of God accepting us, then our failures won't be the basis on which he rejects us. We are saved by grace and kept by grace. And then we see in the rest of the passage the application of that grace to Peter. So, verse 12, Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he told him, follow me. So what is going on here? Because at first glance, this looks like Jesus has set this entire scene up to kind of remind Peter of his failure. So firstly, the charcoal fire. It's interesting that Jesus sets this scene up around a charcoal fire. It doesn't mean much to us, but it's worth noting that John in his gospel only uses that phrase two times. This is actually the second time he uses it. He uses it. The first time he uses the phrase charcoal fire is when he's describing the scene as Peter warms himself outside of the high priest's home. The charcoal fire is exactly the place where Peter had denied Jesus three times. What a stark reminder. Secondly, Jesus calls him Simon. Not just Simon, but Simon, son of John. This is like his full government name. And you, you know that when someone uses your full government name, you're in a bit of trouble. <laughs> Thirdly, Jesus says to him, do you love me more than these? Remember, it was Peter who had said, hey, Jesus, even if these guys abandon you, I never will. It's almost like salt in the wounds. And finally, Jesus asks him this question three times. Three times, of course, mirroring the number of times that Jesus denied, that Peter denied Jesus. So what actually is happening here? Is Jesus just being mean? No, I think think there's more. I think this is actually a sign of his tenderness. Now, we've... We've all had the experience, whether we remember it or not, of going to to the doctor or to the dentist and being met with the words, "Ah, this is going to hurt. But we kind of accept that as part of the the bargain to to get better. Well, Well, friends, Jesus is the great physician. He only hurts so that he can heal. What Jesus is trying to do by exposing Peter's failure is to apply the oil of the gospel to Peter's failures. In fact, what Jesus is getting at is that, Peter, you failed, but your failures is not the, be- the basis of my love and acceptance for you. The basis is 
my finished work. So check out what Jesus does. He doesn't, he doesn't condone Peter's failure. He's not like, uh, Peter, I understand it was late at night. You were under a lot of pressure. Ah, you were lonely at night. I, I get it. That person really ticked you off. I, I, I understand. No, there's none of that. He acknowledges what Peter's done. But he doesn't condemn him either. So he's not throwing him away. He's still engaging with him. Jesus does something better. He commissions him. Now that, that word in Greek for feed, the word that's written feed or shepherd, translates closely to pastor or lead. So what Jesus is saying to Peter is, Peter, even though you failed, even though your failure was the worst, if you come to me, if you repent, your leadership can be the best. Because you were a great failure, you can be a great leader. In fact, check out what the pastor and theologian J.D. Greer says about this passage. He says, Jesus chose Peter to lead his church, not despite his failures, but because of his failures. His failures would put him in touch with God's grace. And God's grace is where a leader's real strength comes from. And then Jesus utters these words to Peter, follow me, follow me. And friends, this is, this is it. This is the punchline. This is the bottom line. This is the big idea. This is the takeaway. It's simply this, that Jesus turns great failures into great followers. Jesus turns great failures into great followers. That in the, in the kingdom of God, in God's economy, failure isn't final. It's actually an opportunity to, to lean in, to press in, to follow him more closely. What do you do when you fail God? You remember that it's Jesus who turns great failures into great followers. And in fact, this is, this is kind of the, the subtle subplot all throughout scripture, isn't it? It's, it's the story of Moses. Moses, a guy who killed an Egyptian in an attempt to start a revolution, gets found out, flees, and then spends 40 years, 40 years tending his father-in-law's sheep. Failure. Yet it's the same Moses that God uses to, to rescue his people from slavery. Well, let's go, let's go David, who we've been learning about for the last few weeks. Now, we've all failed, but I'm just going to go out on, on a limb and say, none of us has taken our friend's wife, gotten her pregnant, and killed him to cover up our sin. None of us has done that. Failure. But Jesus, but David is described as a man after God's own heart a follower, or the apostle Paul, the guy who was breathing fire against Jesus, fires, Jesus followers, approving of their debts. But he goes, he goes on to write 70% of the New Testament and actually pens these words, follow me as I follow Christ. It's, it's, it's a great failure becoming a great Follower. That's what God does. He takes prodigals and makes them prophets. He takes sinners and makes them saints. He takes failures and makes them followers. Cool, Sipo, that's great. How does any of this actually work? How is that possible as we wrap up? Well, the clue is in Verse 7, you see in John chapter 21 that Peter runs to Jesus. But in Luke 5, when Jesus performs the exact same miracle, Peter's words to Jesus are slightly different. In fact, what Peter says is, depart from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. Now, if we're going to talk about sin, we need to be clear on what we're what we're talking about. Sin is cosmic rebellion. Sin is our failure to live according to God's holy standard. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is what separates us from a holy God. Oh, but praise God, there was one who made a way for us. The one who lived a life without failures, the one who took on himself the punishment that we deserved, the one who's risen on, on high in all glory and power. And his name is Jesus. So what happens to Peter? Well, church tradition has it that Peter 
goes on from this, and we, we have accounts of him in Acts, but how he meets his, his end is he's crucified by the Roman emperor Nero. And Jesus' words come true, that his hands are stretched out, and he glorifies God in his death. It's a great failure, becoming a great follower. Okay, Sipo, so what does any of this have to do with the price of oil in China? What, what does this mean for me when I wake up tomorrow? How do I, how do I apply this? Well, let's, let's recap. So when we fail God, what do we do? We get in community. And maybe for, for some of us, that means joining a connect group. Maybe for some of us, it's texting or calling a friend that we trust and sharing the struggles that we're having. What do we do when we fail God? We, we run to Jesus. For some of us, that's running to him for, for the first time. For some of us, it means asking God for the courage to put off the things that would stop us from running to him. The shame, the guilt, the fear, the embarrassment. And fixing our eyes firmly on him and his grace. What do we do when we fail God? We remember that it's Jesus who turns great failures into great followers. What would this mean for your life? If you embrace this, if you embrace that it's true that Jesus turns great failures into great followers, what would that do for your shame and guilt? If we embrace the truth that Jesus turns great failures into great followers, what would that do for that stubborn family member that we've been praying for? Who would we share the gospel with? Emmanuel Church, as we learn to follow Jesus wherever he takes us and whatever the cost, if we embrace that it's, it's Jesus who turns great failures into great followers, who would we welcome into this community? Let's go home on this. So it's 2002. 12-year-old me is about a week and a half into the greatest failure of my life thus far. Not a prefect anymore. One day I get the call from the head teacher's office to, to come in. I'm thinking, what is it now? Sits me down and tells me, Sipo, I think you've learned your lesson. I'm making you a prefect again. As it turns out, one of my friends who incidentally was the head boy at the time on hearing what had happened had kind of been bombarding the head teacher every single day at his office and pleading on my behalf that I be reinstated. I had a mediator. My friends, praise God that 2,000 years ago in a blood-drenched cross on Calvary's Hill, you and I had a better mediator. A mediator who doesn't just plead for mercy for us, but who took on himself our sin. He who knew no sin became sin, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. But he didn't stay dead. He's alive. He appeared many times. And he's still in the business of turning great failures to great followers. Let's pray. I want to just pray for, I guess, three groups of people. Um, firstly, if, if you need to, to get into community, if you felt challenged to share the things that you're struggling with, but I want to pray for you because that is scary. I want to pray for courage 
to do that. I want to encourage you, if that's you, don't delay. Don't wait until you feel like it. Don't wait till the middle of the week. If you feel God stirring you in that direction, do it. Do it now. Do it today. Do it right after this. I want to pray for any of us who need to run to Jesus, but there's things in our lives that feel like lead on our feet that are keeping us from from fully embracing him, whether it's shame, whether it's guilt, whether it's just fear. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you if you're feeling like you're a great failure, that your sin is insurmountable. I want to pray that you would remember that Jesus turns great failures into great followers. So let's pray. If that's you, if you're in any of those categories, can I just ask that you would lift up your hands in front of you, just stretch out your hands in front of you to signify your surrender. And I'll pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is indeed living. It is indeed active. That it sets out and accomplishes the things for which it's purpose to. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here who have their hands raised in each of these categories. Lord, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. And so, Lord, I want to pray for courage for anyone who needs to be vulnerable, who needs to get into community, who needs to uh, speak to someone, that there'd be no delays, God, that it would be prompt action, that you'd quicken us to obedience. But I want to pray for anyone who is feeling weighed down by fear, shame, guilt, embarrassment, or anything else. Won't you give them grace, Lord, to come to you, to see you in your kindness, to see a God who doesn't condemn, but a God who commissions. And Father, I pray for anyone here who feels that their sin is too much. God, that you would show them the extent of your mercy and love, your power to turn great failures into great followers. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.